All right, so looking at today's agenda, um, we're going to start off by looking back at our particle model that we started last week. And then we're going to finish up our particle model of matter that we were working with. We're going to have a lab today called Making Inferences About Particles in Solids, Liquids, and Gases. Um, we're then going to develop some understanding of this lab. Uh, and we will whiteboard our understanding. I'll probably break you into a number of groups and then have you specifically um, represent your understanding to one of the specific portions of the lab today. So you're gonna, it's going to be important that you pay attention to all sections because one of them you may end up becoming uh, the group that ends up presenting um, a specific portion of the lab. What questions do you have before we get started? All right, you need to open up your digital lab notebook. And just as a little bit of a reminder, the other day we worked on identifying uh, a particle model. And we identified solids, liquids, and gases. We talked about how solids are closely packed in regular arrays. They vibrate around a fixed point, and they're strongly bonded. We talked about liquids being closely packed. They move around each other. They're arranged irregularly, and they're weakly bonded. And then gases, we said, were well spaced out. They're arranged at random. They move rapidly, and they are not bonded. And we, we drew many of these conclusions based on our prior labs that we did um, with the vanilla extract in the balloon, with the newspaper clipping, and the images in the newspaper clipping. And also the sugar in the water activity. We also talked about with a particle model, we were going to um, make sure that we drew our particles as circles. And then we talked a little bit about how each one of those circles, in order to show the energy that it has, we were going to add some type of lines to the side of that. Is there anything else that I'm forgetting that we need to add regarding where we have been and what we are doing currently? All right, I want to make sure that we account for all of the things in our particle model that we uh, talked about the other day. I want to make sure there's not anything that we've skipped over. So I'm going to go to that. If you are not on your lab notebook, please open that up. So when we left at the end of the hour the other day, we talked about evidence from activities that we have done either in our lab or from our own experience to help support the model. Somebody was talking about solid desks. Um, when you push pr put pressure on them, they don't flex or move. Uh, and so that would be used as evidence to support this particle model of solids where the, the particles that make it up when you push down on them they, they don't really move, and we thought maybe it was because it was reinforced by other particles below it. We talked kind of about uh, liquids being like um, marbles, and so if you take marbles and you put your hand in them and you move them around, they tend to move around one another. And we talked about gases being able to kind of move through them, like where people were moving their hands around, and they said, well, I can kind of feel the gases. I, it seems to be that I'm hitting something. And, and I can obviously move whatever that object is because my hand is able to move through the gases that are in our atmosphere. So we already established a standardized particle notation. Um, we talked a little bit about how we will show differences in the mass of particles. But we did not talk about how we would talk about differences in masses of particles. So we need to make sure that we establish this this specific information. So we, we talked a little bit about in the balloon activity, must be the particles of the vanilla are slightly 
smaller than that of the particles between the balloon. And what, what was our evidence for that? What was our evidence for the particles of the vanilla must have been smaller than the particles that make up the outside of the balloon? Gilberto? Uh, be more specific. Why, why did we smell it? I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. The vanilla has a strong smell. Okay, vanilla does have a strong smell. Why did we smell the vanilla despite the fact that we put it inside of the balloon? Oh, so, so some of the particles of the vanilla must have escaped the balloon. And in order for them to escape between the particles that make up the balloon, those particles would have to be a different size. Is that true? Oh, they would have to be a little bit smaller. Okay. Uh, that seems pretty good. I, I think that's kind of where we were um, in our reasoning behind uh, stating that some particles must be bigger and some particles must be smaller. So, so let me ask this. How do we want to go about representing that some particles have a greater mass than other particles? So if we're drawing out a model of a particle in this class, how might we want to go about showing that some particles are larger and some particles are smaller? Yes, sir? Okay, so the proposal is to make some particles larger and some of the particles smaller. What do you guys think about that proposal? I'm sorry, what? You like it? So there's support. Can we come to a consensus as a scientific community in this classroom that when we are drawing particles that we believe are larger, we are going to draw them bigger than the other particle? Is that okay? Thumb up if you support. Thumb to the side if you're not sure. Thumb down if you disagree. All right, looks like we have support. So anytime we draw a particle, and we think that the particle is going to be larger, we are going to draw a larger size. All right? Uh, what about differences in the motion of particles uh, between a, a, the state of a solid, liquid, or gas? How did we want to show that we have differences in the state of particles between solid, liquid, and gas? Yes, sir? Okay, so when we are drawing our particles, the proposal is to have some particles close together, and that would indicate a solid, to have some particles a little bit more spaced out, and that might be a liquid, and some particles far apart from each other, and that would be a gas. Does anybody have any other proposal? Yes, sir? Motion lines. Oh, motion lines. Okay, so motion lines might help to show that it's a solid, liquid, or a gas. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay, can you explain what you might do for motion lines? Uh, for a solid, have like one line, liquid, two lines, and gas, three. Okay, so the statement is that we are going to have one line for a solid, two lines for a liquid, three lines for a gas. Are you still in support of what Mr. Levan said? Mr. Levan, are you in support of what Mr. Jarrett said? Can we combine the two? Okay, okay so, so what I'm hearing is we can combine the two. So if we have a solid, we're going to keep those particles close together, but we're also going to add a motion line, saying that it has some type of energy. Is that what our motion line is representing? Okay. And then if it's a, a liquid, we're going to have two lines. And if it's a gas, we're going to have three lines. Okay. If you are in support, thumbs up. If you are unsure, thumb to the side. If you disagree, thumbs down. All right, it looks like we got about 75% of us are in agreement. So we are going to do um, spacing and also um, motion lines to show that the particles are moving. Uh, we started out watching our videos. Is this a true statement? Yeah. Have we watched any of the Eureka videos? Watch one. 
We watched we watched two of them. So we watched uh, molecules in solids, molecules in liquids. We have not watched evaporation and condensation and expanding con contrast. Uh, expanding contract. We Okay. Uh, so, so what what I'm hearing is we are going to need to revisit these uh, these videos. Okay. Um, one of the things that's really important for this section is focusing on the difference between how solids, liquids, and gas particles move and behave. Um, it, the video called um, these these particles little lumps, right? Uh, and what are little lumps doing? They're dancing. Yeah, they're they're in this dance, right? There's motion that's taking place, and as energy is applied, what is happening to the motion, to the dance of these little lumps? What's that? They, okay, they move faster. So they, they kind of move faster and faster and faster until what happens? We keep adding more energy. What was the outcome? I'm sorry. Okay, melting can take place. In order for something to melt, a solid to melt, what has to happen with this motion? What has to happen to the little lumps with the motion? Mr. Parker? Okay. Mr. Hyde, do you want to add something? Okay, so these little lumps are moving faster and faster and faster, and the process of melting, when melting takes place, what did one of those little lumps have to do comparative to the other little lump? So, so they're in this perfect dance back and forth, right? What state are they still in? Oh, they're still a solid. What has to happen in order for it to move to a liquid? Has to get faster and faster, but I, I'm still, they're still in their dance. What what happens in order for it to turn to a, a liquid? Oh, they have to separate. So that there has to be enough energy that breaks one of them off, right? So we have to we have to get to the point where there's enough energy for that little lump to escape. Is that what you're gonna say, Mr. Hungerford? I was gonna say how they started moving You were gonna say what? How they, how their energy was built up. Just say how. How how does energy slowly get the built sun, up? By what? Sun. It's in the video that the sun gets hotter and hotter, and that's why it makes them move faster. Yeah, especially if we're talking like chocolate, right? The example they were using in the video. Yeah. As we had add solar energy, there's more and more energy being added to that chocolate, and eventually one's going to break free, or more going to more of the little lumps are going to break free. All right, in your lab notebook, this is the last piece of information that I think is important for us to add. Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the term that we are going to use for energy of motion. I'm going to go to my lab notebook. I'm going to go right down here below my particle model. And I think maybe this is an important thing to add, maybe at the bottom of our particle model. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. All matter has energy. It might be a little bit of energy or it might be a lot bit of energy. Either way, all matter has energy. And so matter is always having some motion. So particles of matter are in constant motion.
And because they have constant motion, we are going to say that they have ki uh, kinetic energy. Maybe I should have put a comma here instead, huh? Particles of matter are in constant motion, therefore they have kinetic energy. Let me unfreeze this screen, might be able to see it a little better there. Is that better? So kinetic energy is energy of motion. Particles of matter are in constant motion, therefore they have kinetic energy. So we have talked about these energy lines. Um, and so some of the terms that I've heard by, uh, from other students is this idea of like speed tails or whooshes. Um, and so we are going to draw these particles having energy by using like these little, these little energy lines that you guys are talking about. So if we're talking about the amount of energy of a substance, which state of matter is going to have the greatest amount of energy? Which state of matter will have the greatest amount of energy if we're talking about adding these, these energy lines to any particular particle? Mr. King? Gases. Yeah, absolutely. Gases are going to have the greatest amount of energy. Gases will have the greatest amount of kinetic energy. So today we're going to try to discover some more about the properties that exist of these different particles of matter. We're going to add some energy to some of these particles. I would recommend uh, making sure that you are comfortable with knowing how to do a scribble or a new drawing inside of your uh, Google Docs. Once you have this information typed into your lab notebook, please go back to our Google Classroom. Under our Google Classroom, there's a Classwork tab. I added today's lab, making inferences about particles in solids, liquids, and gases. You're going to click on that, and you're going to open up that lab. All right, our first lab has to do with some colored water. And I'm going to kind of video record this with the camera as well. Because I think that maybe zooming in on this and adding some video of it might be important. It might be helpful to us. So I'm going to turn my uh, hot plate on low. I'm going to turn it all the way down. Oh, that's 10. That's not. That's the wrong direction of low. Uh, and I'm going to let my hot plate warm up just a little bit. You will notice I have a flask. Okay. Inside of this flask, I have red colored water. There's a rubber stopper that is on the top of the flask. There is a tube that runs up through the rubber stopper. Mr. Jared, what do you notice about the red liquid in the glass tube running through the stopper? Okay, it's red. So what does that tell you about something maybe being inside of that tube? It 
the inside of the tube is red, what might you conclude about what is inside of that tube? Oh, some of the red water might be inside of that tube. Okay. I'm going to check my hot plate. Yep, it's starting to warm up pretty good. I'm going to take my flask with the red tube in the water, and I'm going to lay that right on top of this hot plate. Mr. Jared, if you could pay extra close attention to that red tube while there is some energy being added to the liquid. Are you noticing anything yet, Mr. Jared? It's starting to go up. Oh, the the wa the liquid that is inside of the um, glass tube is starting to climb up inside of the glass tube. So I want you guys to think about these little lumps and what must be happening as we are applying more energy to it to cause the liquid to move its way up the tube. Once I can see the liquid come out the top of the tube, so they're not out the top of the tube, but at least up past the rubber stopper, we're going to change this experiment slightly, and we're going to go in reverse. Right now, what are we doing to the liquid that is inside of the flask? Warming it up. Warming it up. Okay, so what's happening to the particles of this liquid? I think your hands said it perfectly. They're starting to move all over, right? They're starting to move more. All right? So I'm adding energy, and the particles are starting to move more. I want you thinking about what may happen if I take energy away. So I've got uh, Mr. Xavier was nice enough to go get us uh, a beaker of ice. And so I've got my ice here. And energy is inside of the liquid. And if I take this liquid, take the flask that the liquid is in, and I put it inside of the ice, what do you think might happen? The particles are going to stop. What leads you to believe the particles might stop? Well, they're not going to completely stop, but they're going to slow down. Oh, the particles might slow down. The particles may end up becoming slower and slower and slower. Can you guys see that the liquid is starting to come up the tube towards the top? Okay. So if I take this flask, I'm going to shut off my, uh, my heater. I'm going to put this right here, and I'm going to put the flask inside. So I'm going to readjust the camera so we can see it. So now instead of this being heated, energy is not being added. I want you to think about what might be happening with this energy. And right now it looks to me like that water is still sitting right at the top of the tube. Has it moved yet, Charlie? Um, not, not really? Is that what I heard? It's kind of like right up here at the top, right? It's kind of just sitting there. I wonder why it would just be sitting there if I thought 
to myself, I thought, well, self, if I'm adding energy, it goes up the tube. But I'm taking energy away, it should be going down the tube. And so it makes me wonder right now, why isn't that happening right away? And maybe, maybe the same wondering happens, I wonder why when I put this flask on top of the hot plate, I wonder why as it's sitting there, it didn't start going up the tube right away, but rather it happened later. Ms. Grubal, what's your thought? Um, adding energy makes the particle move faster than So when energy would be put into the glass, the water went faster because it spreads and now it's not dead. Okay. It's cold. Okay. It's actually interesting to me that it almost appears as if the liquid is still rising in that blast right now. Do you, would you say it's rising still? Oh, yeah, the, the two people in the front are kind of supporting that. All right, we're going to continue to let this activity run, and we're going to come back to the questions pertaining to this one. Go ahead and scroll down to the wire station activity. It's station two. We're going to get this one set up in the background. So for this activity, you'll see I've got um, a ring stand. I have, um, this is just a test tube rack or a test tube holder. And I've got some really, 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 really fine, small pieces of metal. You probably can hardly see them. They're, they're probably maybe twice the thickness of a hair. Uh, I'm going to take one of these, and I'm going to attach it. My, I'm getting old, and so my eyes are causing me to not be able to see very well. Uh, and all I'm going to do is I'm just going to wrap it around here and get the wire twisted around so it doesn't just fall right off. Is it like fishing line thickness? Or? Uh, I would say even smaller than fishing line. It is copper wire, so if you want to make a note of that, you could. It's, it's uh, copper wire. And, and now I've got some weights. This one is 50 grams. So I'm going to take a 50 gram weight and I'm going to do the same thing that I just did. I'm going to wrap this 50 gram weight on here. All right, so now we've got our 50 gram weight hung on there. It's kind of just floating there. You guys are like, I can't see it. It's too small. I'm going to take, I'm going to readjust my camera here up to our floating weight. I'm going to zoom in on it. Yeah, there's not much there. It's pretty. It's a pretty thin piece of wire. And now I've got my measuring device. I'm going to take my measuring device, and I think maybe I want to measure from right here, the top of the counter, up to the bottom of my, um, up to my the bottom of my weight. And it looks to me like to the bottom of my weight, I'm sitting at 61.6 yeah, 61 centimeters. 61.6 centimeters.
Maybe I should hold this so that from the camera angle we can see that measurement as well. I don't know if we'll be able to see it very well, but I can put it close. 61.6 centimeters. How many grams of weight did I put on here? Okay, 50 grams at 61.6. Now I'm going to take, uh, well, well, here's another 100 grams. Uh, and so I'm wondering, what's going to happen when I add another 100 grams uh, to this wire? All right, so there we go. I just added another 100 grams. Good, uh, great observation. We are now at 150 grams. All right, so now I'm going to take the measuring device, and I, I think it's going to be important that I still go to the bottom of the first thing I measured, right? So I'm going to take my measuring device, and I'm going to put it right here on the table again. And, well, interestingly, it seems to be at... 61.5, 61.5, definitely 61.5, hmm, that's strange, 61.5, so I added more mass to the wire, and it is now at 61.5 centimeters, that's strange. All right, now I'm gonna I'm gonna go over here. Maybe I'll grab a 200 gram weight. I'm gonna take a 200 gram weight. I'm gonna put a 200 gram weight on here. Everyone's taking bets as to whether it falls. Maybe a 100 gram weight is not the best one. Maybe we should start a little smaller to begin with. You're like no, uh uh. Whoa. It's chocolate. Why well, didn't even have to put a hundred on? Huh? Wait, and it broke. Interesting. So that was only a twenty gram weight. So I had fifty plus one hundred plus twenty. So I had one hundred and seventy right grams of weight, and my wire broke. I don't know where the other half went. I would definitely be either adding notes to my Google Doc or my inferences sheet. I, one of those two I would be adding notes to. My, my digital lab notebook might be the best place, but I could also see maybe adding some notes to uh, just this sheet that's in the assignments and then drawing some conclusions a little bit later. All right, so we added a bunch of weight to that. Um, I'm also noticing that, well, my my test tube here, it still seems to be pretty high. That liquid is right up at the top in that test tube. Or inside of that tube inside of my flask. I guess I probably should use the right terminology, huh? All right, next activity. We're going to move on to the next activity. All right, we have a couple of different objects that we are going to observe for the next one. These are density cubes, um, and they seem to be made out of different materials. Uh, and so I'm going to choose one that's pretty heavy. I'm going to choose one that's quite a bit lighter. And I'm going to get some data on these things. Um, what do we notice about the volumes of these objects? They're the same. They're squares. Why do you say they're the same, Mr. Underberg? 
Oh, so the volume is the same because not they're the volume, exact same not shape. Volume, the area is the same. Uh, the area is the same. Like, like as in the surface area of the object? Okay, so it has the same uh, external, um, the same external amount of surface. How would I find the the surface area of this object? Uh, the perimeter. Oh, how do I find perimeters? Uh, length times width. Okay, length times width. So I do length times width, and that gives me the area of this side of the cube. But there's six sides. So how would I go about figuring out the total amount of surface area? So length times width. Six times, oh, so so this is a uh, let's measure it. Let's figure this out. I'm gonna back the camera off so the camera can see what we're doing here. It does appear to be going down. Uh, so I have my I have my cube, and my cube I, I want to measure it in centimeters. Uh, my cube appears to be three point five centimeters by, uh, excuse me, not 3.5, 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. So my cube is 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. And then the other one's exactly the same, 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters. So can we figure out what the total surface area is of this object? Oh, we can use the calculator. Okay, so what are we going to do to use the calculator? Pick numbers. Okay, what numbers are we going to click? Uh, two point five was the length, and two point five was the width. So, what are we doing right now with those two numbers? We're multiplying them. And what do we do? What do we get when we multiply 2.5 times 2.5? Oh, we get 15. Okay. Can we double check? Can we double check that answer? I got 6.25. 6.25. Okay, that sounds a little bit better. But that accounts for the, the area of only one cube. Right? Oh, how many times do we need to add that? What? Okay, so I've got 6.25 and 6.25. I added it one time. So now I've got two of six sides accounted for. Oh, I got to do it six times total. Okay, so if I take 6.25 and I multiply that six times, what do I get? Thirty-seven point five. So our total surface area for each cube is thirty-seven point five. We've got surface area. Hey, look at that. Sahara got thirty-seven point five. Thank you, Miss Sahara, for adding that. All right, Miss Sahara, would you also type in that uh, the length is two point five centimeters and the width is two point five centimeters? So we have it right there on our screen, easy to see. Uh, somebody mentioned something about volume. Refresh my memory how I determine volume. Interestingly, if I look over here at this tube, it seems to be changing. Uh, somebody refresh my memory. How do I determine volume? Ooh, length times width times height. So we need to know the height of this cube now too, right? All right, so let's figure out the, the height of this cube. Why are you doing it like that? Like it's 2.5 as well. So, so I've got 2.5 times 2.5 times 2.5. Can somebody calculate that for us? Yeah. Ms. Sahara, would you mind adding some units for us so that we know what our measurement is of?
2.5 times 2.5 times 2.5 equals? <laughs> Mr. Parker, you got your calculator up? Yeah. Could you multiply these for us, please? I got 15.625. 15.625. Xavier, did you get the same? So we have 15.625. Now, that was centimeters that we multiplied, right? But we multiplied it three times. How do we represent that this was multiplied three times if we're saying 16 point, what was it, 325? 625. 625. Yes, sir. Isn't it cubed? Yeah, it's cubed. Yes. So it's... A, it's cubed on there, so we add a 3, right? So 16.625 cubed. Are both of these the same volume? Oh, so we have the same surface area, we have the same volume. All right, let's check to see what else we have here as far as information. I have a scale that will allow us to mass these objects. My scale is turning on currently, taking its sweet time turning on. I'm going to grab the camera and move it over here so that I can get a picture of the actual mass. I think that will allow us to do that. So I have this one that looks to be like it's made out of some type of wood. And I'm going to put the first cube on the scale. And the scale is reading 13.14 grams. Yes, sir. Wait, are they both made out of wood? They are not. This one seems to be made out of some type of metal. So that one will be heavier because that one will be heavier than two. Interesting. 13.15 uh, is, is the mass. So they could be the same size or way more. Interesting. I wonder why. So the statement is that one of the materials is going to weigh more than the other one. And I wonder what we know about particles that allow us to make this statement. So 13.15 grams is the first cube. The second cube The second cube is 145.35 grams. 145 0.35 grams. So I now have two cubes. They are the exact same volume. They are the exact same surface area. And yet, these two cubes have something different about their particles. We're going to hold on to our thoughts. No, what was the second cube? The second cube was 145.37. What was the first? 145.37 was for the second cube. The first cube is 13.15. 13.15 for the wood cube. For the metal cube, 145.36. So you said 135.36? Yes, sir. Uh, interestingly, our, our tube in the flask seems to be changing still. But it seems to be happening really slow. Weird. All right, so we've got some information about our blocks. All right, our next activity, our syringes activity. Uh, so, so what we have here is we have three syringes. The first one, each one of these syringes have been epoxied at the end, so the, the matter that's in them cannot come out. It's stuck in here. The first one's got air. All right, uh, and so if I take the air one, 
It is sitting at 43 cc's. Um, yeah, 43 cc's. And if I take this syringe and I press in on it, I can press in to get that to 15 cc. So from 43 to 15 cc. And if I push really hard, I might be able to compress it even more, but I'm kind of exerting quite a bit of pressure right now. Okay? So that's the first, uh, first syringe. I was at 43, and I was able to compress it to 15 cc. The second syringe, the second state of matter that we have been talking about, it's a liquid. Again, same thing. The, the syringe has... Um, some epoxy at the end, so the material is in it, it's not going anywhere. Um, it looks to me like this one's sitting at 34 cc's. And if I take this syringe and I push on it, it looks like I can get to 33 cc's. The tip has epoxy in it, yep, it's not going anywhere. Like not, nothing's getting like inside the cover? Nope, nothing's getting in or out. Oh, yeah. uh, and so if I push on this syringe, I can go from 34 cc's to 33 cc's. The third syringe. Third syringe has 30 cc's of a solid. It looks like sand. And it's packed in there pretty darn good. And so if I take this and I put pressure on it as much as I can, it looks like I'm still at 30 cc's. No change. Yes, sir, Mr. Gilberto? How do you get it standing um, so I packed it in there and then put the syringe on. I had to like flex the edge to get all the air out and then epoxy it. Yes, sir. It was tricky. All right, our next activity. Interestingly, if I go over here to our our little flask, there's been more changes to our little flask. Our next activity, um, I've got one of these uh, little blade air freshener things, and it's, it's closed, but I can open it up. So it's opened up now, and it kind of smells like just soap. It's not the greatest smelling one. Uh, and so I've got my blade freshener. My, it's it's a, a solid inside of here. Oh, I'm, I'm starting to notice more odor right now. I can smell it in this general area. Yep. You guys pay extra close attention in the beginning, and you let me know if you're able to smell it at some point. <laughs> Maybe. Well, the part of it's slowly spreading. And our last activity that we are going to observe. Did I? That's pretty lucky, huh? All right, our last activity has to do with using the liquid. I'm going to take our freshener and move it out of, out of the way. I'm going to put a few things back where... They aren't directly in the way of what we're doing here. 
And I'm going to grab some food coloring. Uh, I think I got purple or red. Purple. We want purple, huh? Okay. Purple. White. Okay. I'm just going to decide. I'm going to decide. I'm going to all right, I'm going to take some of the purple food coloring, and I'm just simply going to put a few drops in here. It's slowly going to spread out through the whole water, but if you stir it, it will make it faster. So I put 10 drops in there. I'm going to see if our camera is picking it up all right. Oh, yeah, our camera is picking it up all right. Maybe I can turn it slightly. I will take the video, and I will put the video on YouTube for all of us to see it. I know it's hard to see, isn't it? Maybe, maybe a different color would have been better. Oh, i I'm going to try it red as well and see what red looks like. It might look a little bit better. Or be more obvious, I guess. The purple was kind of faded. All right. These labs are going to continue to run for a little while. You need to open up this document uh, that is the uh, making inferences about particles. And you need to go back to each section in here, if you have not done so already, and you need to answer each of the questions based on your reasoning and your thoughts. Again, if this document it asks for you to draw a picture or draw a particle model, you are still going to do it on the document. The statement was, you have to do that in almost every one. Um, you are going to go up here to insert. You are going to go to drawing and create new. And now, remember we said in our particle models that if we are representing particles, we are going to do them with sh the shape of a circle. And so I'm going to throw in a particle, and maybe I want to just copy and paste it. And I want a bunch of these circles. I'm going to add a bunch of my particles. And then maybe I need to add some different lines to my particles, because we talked about lines being important for energy. Uh, and so maybe I want to go in here and just grab a line. Or, or maybe I don't even care about just doing a line that already exists. Maybe I just want to do a scribble. And so maybe I'm just going to draw my scribble mark. And there I've got some lines added to it. Uh, you go up to the line uh, section. And you scroll all the way down to the bottom where it says scribble. And you click on that scribble and it'll let you draw. So now I can put lines on each one of my particles that I've drawn. Okay, And then when I click Save, it takes that picture and eventually drops it right inside there where I can easily observe it. What questions do you have before I let you go to finish up this entire document and then submit it? You have 22 minutes remaining in the class. 
I feel as though in that 22 minutes, you should be able to finish this up. If you do not finish it up during class period, I am going to ask during advisory that you get that done. If you have band class, I will give you extra time because I know during band you guys have other things happening. So if you are a student that does not finish this up today, it is due at the end of the day today. If you are a band student that does not finish this up, you need to shoot me an email and say, hey, can I have an extension? Because I didn't have enough time in band. All right? Band students, I will be very flexible with you and your schedule because I know that your schedule is a little more strenuous than those of us that have just advisory. All right, Mr. Filberto, you had a question? Oh, what are we going to do about my grades? I'm going to look at that right now, buddy, and I'm going to see if I can figure out what's going on. And then I'm going to go have a conversation with some people that have more power than me. Okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, please complete that activity in the Google Classroom. Somebody has a question? Sahara is asking a question.